Hey, what's up? This is Mr. Bill. Welcome to the Mr. Bill podcast. My guest today is Tyler Martins, aka Sticky Buds. He's a Canadian producer of heavy, funky, groovy bass music. He's also been a major player on the educational side of things for as long as I have and is a well regarded Ableton expert in his own right. Uh, speaking of Sticky Buds, we have a, a few collabs. Um, we have one called On the Radio that we did a long time ago. We have another one called Hard But Fair. And we have one called Porn Funk, which is on a release of mine called The Collaborative Endeavors. And that will be on Bandcamp along with pretty much all of my other music on June 5th. If you go to my Bandcamp page on June 5th for 24 hours only, I'm going to release my entire discography. Why am I going to do that? Because Bandcamp is having a fee-free day on June 5th. What does that mean? That means Bandcamp is not taking fees from artists. So if you buy my music for five bucks, I get five bucks uh, other than PayPal fees, I suppose, because PayPal is not doing the fee-free day. But rather than getting charged two fees and me getting $2.50 out of the five bucks you spend, I get a maybe $4.50 or something like that. Um, I'm also streaming production sessions pretty frequently on my Twitch page. So if you want to go over to my Twitch and become a subscriber and get some cool badges and spam my chat with conspiracy theories while I'm making bangers, which seems to be a thing that's happening lately, go to twitch.tv forward slash Mr. Bill's Tunes. And as always, go to mrbillstunes.com and sign up to become a hardcore Abletoneer, which gives you access to my entire library of tutorials, sample packs, project files, the art of Mr. Bill, the devices series, all of my live streams, etc., etc. There's so much shit there. And it's honestly really good value if you want to become a better producer that's the place to go in my opinion so uh without further ado uh enjoy the podcast hey you're listening to the mr bill podcast hey you're listening to the mr bill podcast hey you are listening to the mr bill podcast hey you're 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 listening to the mr bill podcast cool man well yeah thanks for coming on the podcast i appreciate it thanks for having me on man yeah finally after I had interviewed all of my famous DJ friends. I can <laughs> now start interviewing my less famous friends like yourself. It's the bottom <laughs> of the Corona Barrel <clears throat> podcast with Mr. Bill and Sticky Buds. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I didn't want to do these online for a long ass time, which is why I hadn't asked you to do it because I hadn't been to Calgary or you hadn't been to anywhere I was um, for a long time. Uh, but generally I was sort of like setting a hard rule when I started this podcast of only doing them in person. I think you get like, you get a better interaction, don't you? When uh, you're kind of face to face, I think it changes the, how the interview goes. For sure. Yeah. I mean, body language is a huge, huge thing, right? Like um, knowing when the other person wants to talk because you can see them trying to jump in with a point or something like that. Or um I don't know, just like hanging out with someone is more fun as well than chatting online. And and also like chatting online just comes with technical issues too. Like I was doing a podcast with Adam Neely yesterday or the day before and like my router just was having crazy issues that day and the call completely dropped for like 10 minutes in the middle of it. And then when like we jumped back into the call, um, it was like difficult to get back to where we were kind of thing. Yeah, no, that would be annoying for sure. I think everyone's at the mercy of uh, technical limitations right now since everyone's doing things online and streaming and, yeah, we're all finding the weak points. Yeah, um, I think it's great, though, that, like, streaming has become so prevalent. I always thought it was, like, a sick medium, and, and I really... I mean, I don't know if it's... I don't think it's that great of a medium, actually, for DJ sets. I feel like they should be also reserved for... Um, well, I don't know. I think there's, like, two two kind of DJ sets that I like. I like really produced ones like your Shambhala mixes or like Subtronics's. Now that's what I call rhythm mixes or whatever. Yeah. Or I like going to a club and seeing it live because then it's like the full body like experience of being in front of a sound system and sharing that same experience with hundreds of other people. I think that's also fun. And then the, the reason I like the produced ones is because it's kind of like you're seeing this huge snapshot of what that, that producer thinks is their ideal DJ set. And you can, you know, if, if they've spent like hundreds of hours mixing it in Ableton and like producing all the transitions really cleanly and all of that kind of stuff, I think it's just nice to sort of hear 
like the top what what they would consider like a top tier flawless set or whatever and also hear all of their influences and stuff at the same time um yeah have you did you have a chance did you see what i've been doing online with my stream yeah i saw like you you were doing um a dj set with like some green screeny background or something yeah but i mean like on top of that like kind of more the the ethos of it is that it's a variety show and i'm not just trying to like play a banging set it's more of like it's actually been something i've wanted to do for a long time i used to work for radio stations back in the day but uh i wanted to make like a a radio show but i'm I'm calling it a, a variety show since we're doing it on twitch and stuff but showcasing music talking about music and i'm still doing some of the like very highly produced like I hired a bunch of voice actors I made like the radio stingers and kind of like the classic ways of of doing a show and then like doing like some cool complicated mixes like I usually would but breaking it up into you know different sections and genres and being a bit more relaxed and yeah I think it's a it's a fun format that I'm really stoked on right now instead of trying to just to make like the most amazing set because I'm doing it weekly now and I'm really going for it um yeah, it's like a bit more of a fun way to kind of like talk about music and a bit more of an education and showcase and, and like bigging up producers and showing people music that they might not know and like all the, the weekly promos and stuff like that. Yeah, that kind of stuff I think is great. Like, I mean, that that's, sh- you know, you're taking the streaming platform and using it in a different way than you would just a DJ set at a club, right? Like, yeah, and that's that's what I've, I've been enjoying about the streaming thing is you see a lot of people take this new format and this new sort of platform that they're maybe not so used to and like using it in their own way because I don't you know DJing in a club <clears throat> has been around for a while like you know 20 or 30 years so that format like there's a lot that's been tried and tested in the in the club format right and it's like we've whittled it down to sort of what works which is yeah playing music through a big sound system and that's kind of you know, getting on the mic every now and then or something like that but with streaming it's like we don't really know what what the potentials are there and like what can work and what can be like you know what what that f- format is best for but yeah it's cool to see people doing all sorts of shit with it like i don't know it sounds like what you're doing is is somewhat maybe similar to i don't know like the hospital records podcast or the noisier podcast or something right mm-hmm. yeah like noisy is definitely showcasing people and stuff <coughs> and and then i've really gone um you know i've put a lot of effort in the design of it and like, you know, invested in having good cameras and my, uh, artists and animators, like I've animated background moving scenes, like different scenes. And, you know, I've actually put quite a bit of work into the production of it and I didn't want to start it until it looked amazing. Uh, but that's usually how I go with when I present myself to, uh, the world, like with mixes and things like that, you know, I'm, I'm always making sure I'm putting forth the best things possible. Yeah, I always find it like <clears throat> cool that you uh, like don't mind investing into things. It seems like um, like every time you've put out an album or put out like a mix or something like that, you don't mind like paying a bunch of people to do voiceover shout outs and like, you know, paying people to you know, do little bits and pieces for you. So like the jobs that maybe you can't do or aren't like specifically skilled at, like you pay the, the people who are like the best at doing that or whatever to, to do it. I'm always... Totally. L- I don't know. I'm always like, fuck, do I really want to invest like 50 bucks into this mix or whatever? <laughs> like uh, even to me, like that amount of money to invest into a, to a mix or a podcast or something is just like, ah, uh, I don't know if it's worth it. I think it just makes your life so much easier. Like, like to do this, um, uh, to do the, the Twitch show and the streaming show. I mean, I had to learn so many new things, like how to set up cameras, how to like, what cameras to even buy, like what frame rates are, how to set up green screens in OBS. And then like I had my VJ packs of animations that um, my designer had done for me that I was using for shows. And then like I learned that they could go into Streamlabs in OBS and they looked amazing. But then I'm realizing that like, you know, I'm on all Macs and everything and Macs aren't very good for doing visual graphic related things. So like my computer is getting all screwed and then I'm having to like invest in like learning about eGPUs so that I can run these things. And then I'm like building these scenes with my designer and having him like, I have all these different pieces and characters and things that we made, um, but I'm having him merge them all into sets. So basically Streamlabs is only playing one visual piece instead of like five or six different things which is really bogging the computer down 
So it's just a huge learning curve. But I mean, for me to try and do all of that by myself, like trying to do animations and art, it's just like completely impossible. And it's just, it really takes a load off of you to find people to work with that you gel with. Cause man, there's so many skill sets. It's, it's impossible to do it all. So like, I love investing, you know, my, my capital would, you know, it doesn't have to be a ton too. It's just like really takes the load off you to get help. You know, you can't do everything by yourself. Yeah, for sure. It's also like, um, you're investing in saving your time a little bit as well, right? Like that's exactly it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm always like, I'm such a time waster. I feel like I'm always like, Oh yeah, I'll learn how to do this thing in blender or whatever. And then it's like three weeks later and I'm like, Oh man, I haven't made any music. (laughs) <laughs> but I mean, you, you invest in like your, your management, you know, to sort out your gigs and like those sort of things. Right. Cause that's not worth your time. And you have yeah. someone who's better at those things and you're happy to pay them to take care of them for you. Yeah, totally. And also people who seem to be like passionate about those things. Um, like some people don't mind jumping in a spreadsheet and doing formulas and making phone calls and sending emails and shit. Totally. And then other, other people are like, the thought of doing so just like rids their body with fucking cold sweats and anxiety, you know, (laughs) you get, yeah. And when you're working with passionate people and they're passionate about whatever they're passionate about, you just get such a better product, you know, cause they've spent their life learning whatever they're good at. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, like people doing things that they actually want to do and getting paid for it and all of that stuff. Um, Maybe we could like start talking about the economy a little bit because I know that you have some thoughts on this. Sure. Uh, and I guess like a good place to start would be talking about like the ideal economy, right? It would sort of be one where people just did exactly what they wanted to do and were somehow compensated for that and the whole system wasn't like built on the premise of, you know, uh, inflated debt, currency debt slavery and yeah exactly <laughs> pretty much yeah um, well i mean yeah. go ahead well like what you're talking about is a free market which is what we supposedly get told we have but we don't have free market economics we have all these massive uh banks and governments interfering with a, a free market and we haven't had that in a really long time uh but yeah i mean i would describe myself as a volunteerist where you should be able to do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anyone Uh, But as far as like the market and economy go, it's been a long, dirty experiment into fiat currencies and and how money works in the world. Uh, And it's quite a a massive topic, but I'm totally happy to talk about it. It's been something that, yeah, I just got super interested in economics and money and currency uh, a long time ago, like maybe 10 years ago. um, A friend of mine gave me this book. Uh, by a guy named Mike Maloney, and it's called uh, The Investor's Guide to Gold and Silver, I believe is the title. And uh, that kind of set me down a path into learning, you know, how governments work, how central banking works, how how currency goes through it, uh, and how currency is created and the difference between currency and money. And when you go down that path of learning how it all works, it's uh, completely infuriating because you and I and everyone else are being scammed and uh, our hard work and labor, which we have to work to earn currency, uh, that's deflated away every year by terrible monetary and economic policy and and we pay, uh, pay the price for that and most people don't understand how it works. Right. So the the reason why money is worth less every year is because more money is printed, essentially making all money worth slightly less, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they deval- devalue the currency by printing more of it. And, uh, you know, you and I don't have the luxury of having a printing press in our basement, but uh, the U.S. government does, the ECB in Europe does, you know, Bank of Japan, all the central banks have uh, their own printing presses to keep deficit spending going. They can keep paying for wars. They can keep paying themselves a million dollars a year to waste time. And uh, yeah, you know, it's like it's a it's a financial apartheid is a, a funny, ex- well, it's not funny, but it's uh, quite the expression that Max Kaiser talks about, who's one of my more favorite uh, exuberant economists uh, slash news celebrities that I watch. And uh yeah, no, it's it's pretty terrible, but and I and I really don't see people investing the time to learn about it, which is unfortunate because I see 
I see a lot of people fighting about things right now. Like humanity as a whole, this is something that affects everyone. And I see a lot of people fighting about trivial shit, you know, like things on the internet. Everyone's just like super fired up arguing about this and that, but like no one wants to address one of the biggest fundamental equality, you know, deterrences that we have in the world. And that's like the creation and the control of the money supply and how money is in the world. So it's definitely something that I would encourage people to dive into. And one of the easiest ways is again with, with Mike Maloney, but he switched from writing books and he actually started a really great YouTube channel. Uh, so he made a video series called the hidden secrets of money and it's very entertaining. It's very well done and it's very eye opening. And I would definitely recommend everyone, you know, there, I think there's seven episodes of like maybe half an hour each, but man, that is such a worthy investment of your time. Uh, I definitely <coughs> would recommend people check that out. Right. Uh, so what, what do you think it is that if somebody invested, say, I don't know how much time it is to read one of his books or watch one of these uh, YouTube series, like what's the, and you invest your time, what's the end result of investing your time into that other than just being more educated on sort of what's going on with money in the world? Yeah, well, the education is the point, you know, that's going to change how you live your life. You know, maybe you're going to value your time a bit more and realize that maybe like, uh, all the effort that you put into earning currency and stuff isn't well spent on like a high time preference where it's like buying flashy shoes or like an $80,000 sports car or, or whatever, like, or like a bunch of junk food or wh whoever knows, but like allocating your capital to savings or growing a business or having a uh, low time preference things where it's like, you're looking at like the bigger scheme of things in the world and like looking way down the road rather than like looking for satisfaction in like the immediate areas. Um, and yeah, and like trying to avoid debt, you know, debt is such a huge one and we are sold debt at every opportunity. And that's how, uh, the banks and the governments and, uh, the corporations control you. They want you to be in debt. They want you to have to make those car and mortgage payments and super high interest credit card payments. And the poorer you are, uh, the worse off you, of a deal you get. So the, the poorest people in society have to go to like payday lenders and stuff who could have like when you look at the annualized percentage rates are like hundreds and thousands of percent of interest. And then you look at, uh, you know, you or I who are, have a, a normal credit card and something, it's like between 18 and 25% interest. But banks and the rich borrow at 1% interest or 2% interest. You're a hedge fund manager or you're just someone with like a massive amount of capital, you get opportunities to get uh, basically free money. Now, interest rates are so low that you can just get money willy-nilly and uh, buy houses, buy um, businesses, investments, whatever you want. Uh, so the richer you are, the more opportunity you have to exploit the system. Uh, and that's actually called the Cantillian effect, which is another thing that people should look into. And, th and that's how equality spreads. And this is what we need to work towards changing. Right. It also seems like um, with credit card stuff and like loans and all of that sort of shit, they almost like make it super fucking complicated just to make it sort of not possible for a lot of people to deal with it. It's the same with contracts, right? Like it, they just put layers of abstraction in a contract, I feel like. For instance, um, <clears throat> and there's a few, I mean, there's a few reasons why you would do this, but my, the general contract you get or the general contract that I see for say like a show or something or like, I don't know, making music for a film or just something like that. It'll start off by sort of saying, all right, this person like me is now known as the artist. And then this person here is now known as the house. And this person here now is now known as the gum, the monopoly gum boot or whatever. Like it's, it just starts sort of uh, labeling people as things. And then when you sort of halfway through the contract, it's like the house pays the monopoly gum boot to the artist 1% of the, and, and like, there's just like this, I mean, language is already a layer of abstraction between what it is I'm trying to tell you right now and you, me telling you, right? Like the language itself is an abstraction, but then it's just like, they're putting another abstraction in the language itself. But it's and, done on purpose though, right? Like, well, there's two, know. two reasons I think they, that it's done. One is, uh, 
because then you could just take any boilerplate contract, change a few names at the top, and then the rest makes sense. And you don't have to go change like 50 names in the contract. Um, although at this point, that doesn't even make sense because, I mean, there's digital shit. Totally. Like you could just change one name at the top and just tell it to format all the other names the same. Um, the other reason is just because they, they're they designing it in such a way that you can't do it by yourself. Like you have to <laughs> hire their yeah. other lawyer friend who plays golf with them on the weekends. Totally. I mean, yeah, you're supposed to be anything complicated like that. They want you to be kept in the dark. So you need help. And then so you also can't do it for yourself. But, you know, and they also, want it to be. Oh, sorry, go on. I was just going to say they want it to be complicated. I mean, and, and it's the exact same thing with, you know, how you went to this tangent is like, that's why. Uh, bank contracts and credit card contracts and loans and mortgages and everything it's supposed to be super complicated that's why we're not really taught that early in school you know how contracts or taxes or money or or currency works you know it's we're supposed to be just happy little tax cattle buying and spending and uh, you know they're happy when we stay in that bubble they don't want us to understand behind the scenes right so what do, what, like, what do you think is the potential outcome for everybody sort of being the, the tax cattle and the, the government sort of just inflating money in the way that they are and, you know, everybody just sort of accruing all this debt and stuff? Like what, what's the end game for something like that? Uh, well, most, uh, you know, like Austrian style economists and people who study believe we'll be heading, there's, I guess, a couple different scenarios. One definitely would be like a Weimar style hyperinflation, like what happened in uh, 1929, I believe, in Germany after World War I uh, and what's happening in like Venezuela right now and other places around the world. And so like a a hyperinflation is just basically when uh, every day things are getting so much more expensive uh, because they just continue to inflate and create uh, currency. So like you're bringing, like in, in Weimar and in, in Venezuela, uh, they're bringing wheel, wheelbarrows full of paper money to buy a loaf of bread, you know. So w- this week, bread costs 100 bucks, and next week, bread costs $1,000. So that's a, a, a hyperinflation event. So th- Wait, that's actually happening in Venezuela? Oh, yeah, totally. There's, uh, there's pictures of the, the streets of Venezuela are just lined with money because it's w- literally worthless. Um, oh, sure. And, yeah, no, that's that's been happening for over a year, I think. Um, the uh, wait, what what remember- what is um, what has their government done that's been so silly that it's made their money so worthless? Uh, a lot of people would say socialism. Okay. So uh, it's just mismanagement of government and currency. So like the the main problem that we have is that governments and financial institutions can collude together. We don't have a free market currency uh, and we have collusion and we have all this shady shit of people at the top working together to enrich themselves and keep uh, keep the standard that they have control of the money first. And so, yeah, so it's just like there's too much currency. And then like that main problem all these smaller countries are having right now is that they're going up against the U.S. dollar and the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency. That's what oil is bought and traded for the majority of the time up until recently when some of the bigger countries have now started to uh, transact in their own currencies like Russia and China. But uh, so it was called the petrodollar, the, the U.S. global reserve currency. But so... Um, yeah, like their Venezuela's dollar has been massively devalued uh, against the U.S. dollar. And that's happening everywhere in the world right now to every single currency. So every currency in the world has now lost, especially in these last uh, few months since uh, COVID started. And uh, the government's really all started turning out the printing press, uh, like the Canadian dollars down like It was down like 10, 15 percent and same with the Australian dollar. And then like these other countries like Venezuela and Brazil and Argentina and the smaller emerging markets are just been destroyed. But Venezuela was doing terrible uh, a long time ago before this. Right. Um, So at a time like this, if you were uh, sort of into buying and trading money, now would be the time to buy a shitload of Canadian dollars and then sell it back at a higher price. 10 or 15 percent after covid sort of finishes its cycle and the economy sort of restabilizes if it if that ever happens i mean the trade would have been like before if you could see the future to if you were a canadian or anywhere else in the world to put all your money into u.s dollars 
And then once your currency dropped against U.S. dollars, you would get 15% more if you traded it back. But I mean, that trend is going to continue and a much better use of your currency would have been to put it into gold, silver, Bitcoin for sure. So why why is that? Like, well, I know that you are into investing in uh, metals and crypto. What What's the like, yeah, what's your thought process there, I guess? Yeah, I mean, like the main takeaway is just it's not controlled by the government. It's an actual free market money. Um, and, I, and I guess like the main difference between currency and money is that money retains its value over time. So going back to, uh, you know, the Romans and like gold and silver for one have been used for as money for 5,000 years. So going back to when the Romans, like one gold, whatever denomination, I can't remember what it was called, but one, we'll just say an ounce, an ounce of gold bought you a really nice toga with like the nice trim and like really fancy flash toga. And then, you know, come to today's time, one ounce of gold will buy you a very nice suit. So like an ounce of gold in Canadian terms is at an all-time high right now. It's around twenty six, twenty seven hundred dollars uh, with the premiums. And I think in American dollars, uh, $1,700. But over time, the point being that that gold has kept its purchasing power for you know, 5,000 years since it back when the Egyptians, you know, started trading, uh, in gold and silver. Right. Um, the, yeah. the, the thing, the thing with crypto though, um, like I don't know much about gold and silver, but, but I feel like crypto is not what you're saying it is like, um, for instance, in terms of, uh, it being not controlled by a government and it being like anonymous and, and all of the things that people say that it is or is supposed to be, <clears throat> I feel like it's not. So for instance, the reason I think this um, is because if you like make a transaction on the blockchain, as far as I know, it is actually possible to follow it back and figure out where that transaction came from. And then also in, in terms of like who controls it, I feel like there's these big mining farms like in China. And then I think like, you know, there's people like Roger Ver and stuff like that who just own large, large amounts of Bitcoin and other coins. And essentially if they own the most, they kind of have the biggest market share. And I just, I don't think crypto like solves the problem of human greed. And I feel like I've seen that happening still in the, in the crypto crypto community and then in on top of that um it's just not as safe like for instance if you have a credit card it's insured right like if, if I, i've made transactions before to companies who then haven't come good on their end of the deal like you know buying i don't know a piece of software or something and then i don't get sent the piece of software or the piece of software doesn't work and then i go like all right well i want a re- refund and then the company's like, no, fuck you, I'm not giving you a refund. So then I just hit up my credit card company and be like, hey, this is an unauthorized transaction or the transaction was not as described. And then they just refund me, I guess, because they, I don't know, somehow have the ability to do that. I'm not really sure how that works, but crypto for sure does not have that. So like, there's a few things that I think are sort of broken with it still, but I hope get figured out eventually. Okay, so first of all, crypto is bullshit. Um, the 99, you know, I mean, I'll just say, I think everything except Bitcoin is garbage. Uh, the majority of every other coins is just a pump and dump scheme. Any of these guys who've created other cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin, the majority of them are derived from the Bitcoin code. You talk about Roger Ver who created Bitcoin cash, same thing with Bitcoin SV. And there's all these different things of people trying to sucker you out of your money to make themselves richer. Uh, Bitcoin by far has the largest code base, the largest amount of developers. You know, the smartest people in the world are working on this. Uh, I wouldn't put any capital into anything else other than Bitcoin. It has the strongest computer network in the world. Uh, To go over like the mining point, yeah, for sure. It was heavily centralized in China, but that's now diversifying. Like um, I believe Peter Thiel, I, I think he was one of the founders of eBay. Uh, he's making a $500 million mining farm in Texas right now. Like bas- basically it's going to work and it's already diversified. But, like, but then uh, doesn't Peter Thiel then just sort of, you know, then he's like the, the centralizer of, of the coins? No. So all he has is a large amount of mining power to solve these cryptographic problems that happen every 10 minutes. So he's going to have more computer 
hashing power than the average person, meaning he'll get more Bitcoins than the average person as the, the reward. Because when you solve these uh, cryptographic problems, these blocks, you're rewarded with Bitcoin. That's how new Bitcoin are created. So you can't just uh, print them willy nilly like we our governments do with the US or Canadian dollar or insert fiat currency here. So there's scarcity, which is one of the main important things to realize that this is actually a money that is created due to math at a fixed outcome. And there's ever only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoins. There'll never be more than that with Bitcoin, you know, and, and you can take the Bitcoin code and you can make Mr. Bill coin and you can make it have a forever limited supply, but no one's going to value it because it doesn't hold these properties of what money is. Um, so you said, uh, you know, talking about if you have a whole bunch of Bitcoin or something that makes you like, basically we call them whales and you can manipulate the market. And yeah, that is happening for sure. Uh, you know, human greed is always going to be something, but it's actually used to the benefit because people who are speculating to try and make money and control the market buy and hold these coins and invest in the infrastructure, invest in the code base and, you know, there's there's the a few sides of it, but there's the people who are just in it just to make more U.S. dollars, you know. Uh, and then there's the people who see the big picture, who want a money that's free of government control, free of, you know, uh, terrible policies that create inequality. And they want to get a money that's out of control of the current system. So like, you know, and, and here's like a reason why Bitcoin has an advantage over like gold and silver. So like places in like Venezuela and places in Weimar, Germany, you know, and places where persecution happens, uh, if your country is going down the shithole and you're trying to leave, well, there's a whole bunch of guys with guns at the border and they're going to search you and they can already confiscate your bank account. They can already take your gold and silver because they make you go through a metal detector and whether you got it hidden inside of you or in a briefcase, they're going to find it. Wait, this so, is if you're trying to leave Germany with gold or silver... Yeah, or anywhere, or Venezuela, or right now. Um, you know, you can't go over an international border with more than $10,000 of currency or gold or anything. The government has imposed that restriction that if you're caught with anything more than that in value that you don't declare it, they'll take it from you. And that's happened over and over again. So that's just an, an arbitrary rule that the government has decided to impose that they don't want you moving with more than 10000 uh yeah, like what benefit does the government have to to for imposing that rule? Uh, well, they don't. They they want to know where the money is. They want to know where the currency is. They want to know who's walking around who has more than ten thousand dollars. This guy does. Okay, why? Where'd you get that money? You know, you know. It's just like it's a, a control system. So let me let me make the the point is that Bitcoin you can get on a plane uh, with uh, your private key, a list of twelve or twenty four words basically, um, and have that money with you, you know, and you can move uh, across any border that you want and no one can take that from you unless you screw up and, uh, you know, fall for a scam or, you know, and this goes to another one of your points, uh, about just being responsible for your own money. So a lot of people like having the fact that if you get ripped off, you can call your credit card company and have a transaction, um, reversed or, blah, 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 things like that, you know, or pe lots of people like feeling that they don't have to worry about their currency because it's supposedly in a bank with FDIC insurance and, and yeah, someone's taking care of it for you until, you know, the things collapse and there's a bail-in like happened in Cyprus in 2010 or 2009 or something. Uh, so that was everyone who had more than a hundred thousand dollars in the bank got, I think, twenty or thirty percent of uh, their funds taken away, confiscated by the banks and government. Or like in Italy a few years ago, when they were having a whole bunch of uh, turmoil, the banks limited it to, uh, I think, like fifty dollars a day you could take out. You know, like you're not actually in control of your money. People think they are until they're not, and then you get a really rude awakening. And uh, that's coming because the governments have just completely lost control. The system is so built on debt and free money to all the financial institutions and banks and Wall Street that they can never 
they can never stop quantitative easing, which is what started after the 2008 collapse. The free money has to go forever or like the stock market is done. And because since uh, COVID and the bailout packages, the new bailout packages, they printed like three or four trillion dollars in new currency that have gone pretty much straight into the markets. And they've given a little bit to us peasants to keep us from rioting in the streets. Uh, but the the return of capital to you and me compared to what Wall Street and the banks have gotten, again, I don't know what the multiple is, 20, 30, 50 to one per, I don't know. It's like a, an absolutely insane amount of money that's gone to them. Um, I, looking at my notes here, like a, anonymous. Yeah. So like that's actually one of the main benefits of Bitcoin is that it is a blockchain that's available for everyone to analyze and make sure is real. So it's transparent, which is actually a total plus because right now we can't see the balance sheets of our governments or financial institutions or anything uh, that that's not there for us to see, but it's, it's there on Bitcoin. And now whether you're anonymous or not is a different story that, that matters whether you've signed up to a place like Coinbase or any of the on-ramp institutions and, uh, you know, how the laws work and how our governments are regulating it is that you need to sign up with your driver's license and take a picture and blah, blah, blah. So as soon as you do that, and then they send you coins to your wallet, you know, it's basically like they can start tracking you that way. Uh, but there's things being, you know, there's different cryptocurrencies and this would be a reason why some say others have value, uh, that are a bit more elusive in their tracking where you can't tell where, uh, coins are exchanged and who owns what and it's a bit more hidden but that technology is also being built out into bitcoin right now there's um schnorr signatures and taproot are two things that are being developed right now like it's it's a giant system of so many brilliant people literally like the smartest people in the world they're leaving banks they're leaving tech companies they're leaving uh <laughs> government and uh they're building the next financial system and then so it's up to people to educate themselves on why it's important and be a part of that and not just be like, you know, most people just see Bitcoin as being a thing they heard about for a couple of weeks when the price was pumping up to $20,000 in 2017. And then they hear that it crashed and then they hear about 50,000 other cryptocurrencies. And most people just write it off as a scam. But there's actually something uh, one of the most important things in human history is happening right now, and that's the development of Bitcoin, and it's the development of a sound money. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I'm reading a book at the moment, and one of the big things it talks about is a thing called the growth trap. And it's talking about how, like, uh, in a lot of society, these systems are built sort of in place um, – not to like actually add any value to the system, but just to like basically extract money at different points in the system. So for instance, like banking is s similar to that, right? It's like, it's just somebody getting between like your money and, and you or you and a deal that you're trying to make. And then they're just sort of middlemanning the whole thing to extract some money from you. And I guess like a lot of, um, a lot of companies like that, you know, like a, I read an article a few years ago that was kind of like the middleman as the new sort of guy who's going to make all the money so like uber right is a middleman they, they sort of connect people who want to get driven to people who drive um or you know like uh i find a lot of even <coughs> software or not software like like music companies do this this uh, i won't name names but like there's companies where you'll go to their website and it's like you can buy a shitload of plugins that they didn't make there you can buy a shitload of sample packs that they didn't make there and, and are also available on other websites and like literally it seems like that website's job is just to house a bunch of shit that you can buy there so they can skim money off the top of each sale made right totally i mean that's how a lot of the world works and, and it's kind of referred to as like rent seeking where you're just like skimming you know and pulling uh capital out of people but yeah i mean there's so many industries that are like that for sure. And I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So it's, so I, uh, yeah, I guess the, the reason I made that point was, uh, that was kind of, it seemed like one of the things that you said, it sounded like Bitcoin was solving. Yeah. So like, there's lots of examples of it too. So like remittances is one of the big things where Bitcoin can really shine. So people who work, uh, or are from Africa or the Philippines or, or wherever, it doesn't matter, but they're coming to North America to work and 
take uh, currency and send it back to their families because it's just worth so much more there. So the majority of people who do that have to use something like Western Union or through their banks. And both of those uh, options can be like a 20% fee. Like if you if you ever had to send money with Western Union, like the fees they charge is insane. There's so much money to be made by, uh, you know, having control of currency because everyone has to use it. And there's so many choke points where everyone takes a little cut. What Bitcoin can do is that you can buy it and send it directly to your people. Uh, so these remittance companies are getting set up and there's still lots of like moving parts, but that's happening. You know, that's just one industry. You know, we could have, you said Uber, you know, so Uber is going to get uh, replaced by just straight AI, you know, Tesla cars eventually or something like that, where you can just pay with your cryptocurrency, book a car. There's not going to be people anymore. It will just be like a direct connection of internet money and it'll just do whatever you need. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that happening. Um, speaking of uh, people like me kind of getting cut out of the picture a little bit, do you think we'll ever go back to um, like a bartering society type system or, or do you think that's kind of behind us as well? Well, I mean, we do sort of have that. It's just because that barter was just made efficient by having currency. So instead of me trading my four fish for your 15 geese or whatever, we do decided to have a currency that was like accountable and that we could price everything in one thing. So that worked great until we went to like fiat systems. And I mean, it was gold before that. And then it turned into fiat where it's just basically by decree, the government says we're using this money. And after 71, 1971 was when Nixon took America off the last of the gold standards. So basically the currency was just paper. Uh, so it's fine, but the unfortunate thing is there's people at the top who have control and can get, we, they can get currency for way cheaper than you and I can get currency. And that just leads to like the inequality we find ourselves now. If it all breaks down, which is a, you know, a possibility in the future, then yeah, maybe we'll go back to some sort of barter. But I mean, people barter still, like I know people who will go, uh, trade their services. They're skilled in one area and they'll go do some, you know, a, a contractor will go build a deck for his friend and his friend's a mechanic. So the mechanic like fixes his car whenever he needs it. You know, people always still, still barter. Yeah, for sure. Uh, <clears throat> going back to crypto a little bit, um, when I first met you or not when I first met you, I think when I went to your house once, I like saw you using Brave. And at the time I was like, oh, why do you use this? And I, I mean, I assume it's just because you don't like being tracked and you don't like ads. Yep. Uh, and then I met Jan, obviously, who works there. Um, so now I'm a huge, uh, I, I don't know, I use Brave, so I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that as a currency? Uh, it's just another shit coin to me, honestly. <laughs> and I and I think it would, they'd be well suited to switch over to Bitcoin and get the Lightning Network going as soon as possible. I mean, okay. do you for, understand what, why, why BAT exists? the it's the basic attention token right and so like you're supposed to get money if you view their ads and it's basically their own kind of economy right yeah so i guess the point is that like um you need ads on the internet so people get paid and stuff like that and if you solve that problem by just blocking all ads then it kind of like breaks a shitload of the people who, like a bunch of people are supposed to be getting paid then are not getting paid um, so I guess, yeah, it's just a system in place to sort of fix that. So it's like they show you ads locally, which is safer. And then from watching or seeing those local ads, you then get paid in brave attention tokens or basic attention tokens or whatever. Yeah. I'm not saying there's anything, I'm not saying that is a, a shit system or anything. I think that's great because people should have the option if they want to watch ads and get, you know, some monetization from that. Everyone should be able to have that choice for sure. I'm just saying they chose the wrong currency to use their own uh, shitcoin instead of just using Bitcoin. But but to their credit, when Brave uh, came out, Bitcoin wasn't ready to do that sort of thing because if you're transacting on chain, uh, a settlement takes you know between ten minutes and an hour, depending on how much uh, sats you pay to get the transaction through. But now that the Lightning Network is being developed and is like going full force, the second layer scaling on top of Bitcoin, that's the sort of thing that Brave could use and actually use a currency that people value. No one gives a crap about that except to trade it for more Bitcoin, unfortunately. And, that you know, I'm not trying to 
be a dick to brave because I love their product and I've been using it since the very start. And, and I've seen, uh, from what I believe like a couple of years ago, the, I think the guy who created, um, brave or maybe, I, I don't know if bat and brave are the same creator. Uh, but he was fighting with a whole bunch of Bitcoin guys. So, uh, there's unfortunately a lot of like, like toxicity gets thrown around in this space a lot, but there's a lot of people who fight for whatever reason. Cause basically everyone thinks they're right and everyone else is wrong. And that just happens everywhere. But, uh, from my perspective, I hope they migrate over to using Bitcoin and the lightning network. I think that would be to their advantage. Um, so I guess I, I just have like one more question on this whole like money and economics topic and then we can probably move on to some other shit. Um, I guess like I'm just uh, interested in like what you your suggestion is or what you've done to sort of deal with this entire problem. Yeah. So, I mean, what you can the only thing you can really do on a personal level is just to choose to opt out of the system. So, you know, look and and I'm not telling anyone to go out and buy gold and silver or Bitcoin or whatever. I'm telling you to learn the concepts and understand it. And then if you think if it's a good idea to go and do it. But uh, yeah, I refuse to give my hard earned time stored in money to any of these institutions. So I'm going to find a way to keep that out of their hands. I don't go into debt. You know, I don't do any kind of flagrant, you know, shit that requires a large amount of debt. I refuse to buy a house because I think the current housing system is a total Ponzi scheme too. Uh, you know, I'm going to store my hard earned time in a money that I think is valuable and will hold its value. And, uh, so I think your personal choices can lead to change because if everyone understands how currency and money work and how they're literally ha- being stolen from, through inflation, through terrible government economic policy, uh, you know, then you can, everyone can change the world together. You know, I'm obviously not going to be able to uh, have the government change, but they'll only change when they're forced to. And I mean, if you kind of, people talk about game theory and it's basically just the way that governments are doing, you know, like China and Russia and all these other countries, they're going to stop wanting to deal in U.S. dollars uh, because the, you know, if, if you and I, Bill, were transacting all the time and um, I was selling you goods and you had a printing press at your house just making money every day and you're, you know, you're paying for my labor to come over and paint your walls or whatever, cook you sandwiches, I'd probably get pretty sick of it because I know you're just creating that money under thin air. So countries and people are going to want to go to an exchange that isn't like be able to create it like that. And, you know, and that used to be gold and it still for the most part is because central banks still hoard gold and all the central banks are trying to like get control of their gold right now. Most of it was kept in the, in the U S at the mint supposedly and, uh, in, in London at their gold storage. Uh, but countries don't trust each other now. So what's going to happen is that, uh, I mean, it's a pain in the ass if, if so, say, like, whatever, uh, China wants a billion dollars in oil from Russia and Russia's like, yeah, we don't want the Chinese yuan and China doesn't want the ruble. So they want to transact in gold. Well, to transact in a billion dollars of gold requires an army, air force, uh, you know, giant planes and guns and all sorts of stuff. And you got to fly it across the world. And then once it's there, you have to verify that it's not filled with tungsten or something else. So you have to break out these spectrometers and test it and like, what a mess. Or what's going to happen is that uh, they'll fight it tooth and nail, but they're going to have to transact in Bitcoin. And when, as soon as like a smaller country or a bigger country, who knows, it could be happening right now, but, uh, you know, it, the world is going to change and it's, we're going to have to move to a sound money. And, you know, I'd put my bet on that being Bitcoin. They'll try and do it with gold, but it'll, it'll move to Bitcoin. Mm, Fair enough. All right. Let's hard pivot from, uh, monetary systems and economics to, uh, music. Sweet. (laughs) <laughs> That's cool. That, that that was sweet to talk about, you know, like I, I don't think I've ever really gotten to publicly like chat about that. So I think it's sweet that you'd want to go there, Bill. So big up. Oh yeah. No, I know it's something that you're passionate about and it's something I'm interested about as well. And I think like, um, I mean, I don't think the monetary system and how we trade against each other and all of that kind of stuff is like the biggest issue in the world. I think it's a big issue. But I don't think it's the biggest of issues. But I think the biggest of issues is just like inherent human issues like greed, right? And that's, I mean, I guess I'd, 
I just think of it from less of a practical what can I do now standpoint and more of an idealistic oh, it would be cool if things were like this standpoint so I think like it's I don't know it's something I love talking to you about all the time sweet yeah um, cool I wanted to talk about uh, like we were talking about sort of DJing and Twitch stuff earlier um, <clears throat> and another thing I really like talking to you about is like set preparation and putting together DJ sets and I know a lot of people listening to this uh, podcast and music producers um, and one one I guess issue I have or not not so much issue but something I, I find to be like the most painful part of my job is putting sets together like it seems to be this thing that I've just always had an issue with and other friends of mine like even Tipper um, has also espoused this idea to me like he also thinks it's the the one part of his job that, that he can't have fun with and it's always just a giant amount of stress for him or whatever yeah. um, but it seems to be something that you are really comfortable doing and and you put out a new set every year for Shambhala and like you have a whole system where you where you put these big in, intricate crazy Ableton sets together and then you cut it out like render it all out and play it on Serato somehow so I guess like I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about your process there and like how you go about about this whole uh set inception to <laughs> finished version of the set type thing yeah nice one i mean well i'll say right off the bat that it's not like a picnic for me too you know i sort of dread doing it every year too i always say that uh doing my set at, at shambhala is uh it's the worst and best time of my life every year just because it's so you know i put so much uh pressure on myself to just create the most coolest set i can uh but yeah i mean like i always um I was talking about my musical influences a long time ago and uh, in another interview. And one of the first guys I ever really got into, uh, his name is DJ Rectangle. He's from America somewhere, like a really awesome hip hop DJ. And uh, I never knew this, but someone told me in passing one time that he was one of the first DJs to start making multi multi-track recording mixes in Pro Tools. And it made a lot of sense hearing that like 10, 15 years later, why I liked him so much is because he was one of the first guys where you were listening. And so, so he was like a, a hip hop DJ, but it have a, whatever the rap song was, but then the beat would change while the acapella, while the vocal was going. And then like on the new beat that came in, he'd drop another acapella and switch it out and then it was like this layered approach and then he'd be like scratching while the tracks are changing underneath and like it was basically impossible as a human and this was turntable days back then like i'm talking this is two, 2000 1999 1998 something like that like pro tools was probably just starting um and it was amazing you know it was pushing creativity to a level that till that point hadn't been possible and I didn't think about it back then but I realize now that's why I liked it so much and I think that was such a huge influence on me and on what I really like doing with music because as soon as I started which was in you know I, I bought myself turntables in 2004 and started teaching myself how to DJ and then I went to music school that same year and learned how to produce from 2004 to 2006 and I just I started taking the art of DJing and like merging it with production to make this cool hybrid of like starting to do things that weren't possible at the time. Because when I started, it was still straight vinyl. Um, and then like kind of Serato came out a couple of years later and started doing like digital. And I had like, uh, I actually had a Newmark CDX too, which was the first digital thing I got. And Tipper loves those. He was one of the first guys I saw. Uh, it was a really cool piece of technology, but unfortunately they were made terribly and every single one in the world broke. It was, uh, it was a giant, it was, it was a 12 inch record CD player made by Newmark. It's called the Newmark CDX and it had this amazing pitch lock on it. And so, and like you could scratch on it and it was sick. It was so cool. And Tipper used to use them all the time in his sets. I haven't seen him play live in a while so I'm sure he's not using them anymore but um yeah it was a really cool piece of technology um so like you know the sorry that's a bit of a sidetrack but you know basically I just loved being able to take different elements and you know it comes down to like stems and instrumentals and acapellas and stems for anyone listening that doesn't know is just pieces of a song the drums the bass the vocal the effects the guitar whatever um, taking elements and like playing full versions and then breaking it down into elements and changing the tempo and bringing in 
you know, different vocals that are all in the same key. And I mean, you know, harmonic content and mixing harmonically has always been something that I've really found important and something that I've always not enjoyed so much, like uh, when it's not done. Uh, I just find that people, even if they don't, uh, know that music is being mixed harmonically and stuff. If you're doing long mixes and running vocals and instrumentals and all these things together, it just makes for a really enjoyable listening experience. So over the last, um, let's see when I started, like, yeah, like last 10, 15 years, it, it's always just been something I've loved to try and excel at and get better and learn new techniques of engineering really cool mixes and so like I've always prepared my sets for the most part and um, you know when Sean Blah comes around uh, uh, all my friends hate me because I'm emailing them every day being like hey man can I get the acapella to this song and yeah sorry you bounced it with reverb can I get it without reverb and can I get the guitar like just in this one section and sorry you bounced it with like the backing guitar and the main guitar can you just send me them separated out so I can you know, I'll just hear in my head and know what I want to do. And I'm, you know, appreciative of, of I'm on so many and I've worked with so many people and labels and, uh, you know, I'm on a lot of promo lists of all sorts of different genres. Uh, so all year and, and all the time, I'm just collecting really cool music and I'm keying it and I'm getting stems and I'm working with people and producing my own music. And uh, then there just comes a time when I get to collate all that and bake it into this super interesting new cake. And then, I'll, yeah, I'll make it all in Ableton and then I'll export out the pieces. So a piece could be an acapella, like just a clean acapella that eventually merges into an instrumental. And then halfway through that instrumental, the vocal cuts out. And then I'll mix another acapella piece onto that that eventually merges into an instrumental. And then maybe those two things at the end of that track, both at the same time change tempo. And at the end of that tempo change, I do scratching with the, the vocal or do some sampling or, or do, right, do so, whatever. So in this example here, <clears throat> where you're saying you'd have a track has one acapella over it. Halfway through the track, the acapella switches. Maybe some other element comes in over the beat and then the beat switches or something. Like, How would you render all of that stuff out to then DJ off to uh, turntables in Serato? Like, how, What would the sort of track rendering and naming look like for that, uh, for that routine? Yeah, so, I mean, if anyone really wants to look exactly what I'm talking about, if you go to youtube.com slash stickybudsmusic, I have a, a YouTube video on there that I did a lecture for a, a school. Someone just asked me to talk about what I do. Uh, so there's a Sticky Buds Advanced DJ set on my YouTube channel, and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but so I make groups. So it's like a huge checkerboard long. I basically engineer an entire set with all the tempo changes and all the edits and changes and stuff. And I'm just making like a really complicated puzzle. And I mean, just because of my own standards and because I like to scratch and stuff, like I want to still mix those pieces. I mean, the actual DJing part of it is the easy fun part. I've done all the hard work. I've done all the selecting. I've done all the editing. I've, I've done my best to find the absolute cream of the crop of what I can accomplish with these pieces of music. Uh, but then when I'm DJing, you know, there's still like, I'm still doing a bunch of like EQing and mixing and like, you know, I get to like pull the beat out from under the acapella at choice moments and like, whatever, jump around and like do things. I'm still doing stuff, but I mean, it would be a bit more boring, but I could just hit play on one Ableton set and just go play the set I made and be like, here's a set, but that's not very entertaining, I think, to people. And because I, I still am a turntablist at heart, you know, I still get to do, uh, I, I still do some scratching and, and things and put on like a show. But the hard part is definitely the composition of the mix. So in Ableton, I'm making groups. So like, so say it starts with an acapella and maybe like an intro, a big explosion and a bunch of sound effects. Uh, so say that's four channels, uh, four channels of effects, uh, acapella, and then the acapella gets merged with the beat. So in Ableton, that's just the beats under there. Uh, and then halfway, and, and so the, we'll say that acapella continues halfway through that song. And then at a certain point, that acapella stops and the song is an instrumental from then on. I would take all those effects, the acapella channel and the instrumental, group all of them into one group in Ableton and export all of that as one track. And then, 
Yeah. And then the, it would be the same for whatever I'm mixing in next. It would start with an acapella and eventually lead into a track or okay, something so, like that. So at any given time, <clears throat> uh, like 10 channels or something can be sort of grouped into one stereo wave. And then you're only ever sort of like mixing one track into one other track, but then you're sort of leaving one deck open for scratching on sort of. Yeah, it's kind of like there's always like vocals and tracks transitioning. Like usually there's two or three, you know, or four things kind of mixing at the same time, but just on the two two decks. And then like and then like doing the system, you know, uh, the acapella in the very first track can come in four tracks later because it's the same key and it's like you know I started with like mid tempo and then I'm at drum and bass four tracks later and that same acapella can come in again because I've just like engineered it to do that. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm still, I'm mixing like kind of track by track, but there's usually there's acapellas playing on either side. And then they're just, I'll have like uh, literally like a five second window to switch to the next piece and bring that in. Right. So assuming, uh, so, so you, you historically, since I've known you have toured pretty hard, it seemed like you had sort of like a like a world circuit that you would always do where you would just be in Australia at the start of the year and then you'd be doing like Canada sort of in the summer here and, and um, you know, then you'd, you'd do like Europe once a year and it seemed like you were just doing one tour in each of these spots every year and then Shambhala was kind of the big commemorative, like here's the, the best of all of the sets I'd done that year kind of thing and like this whole fresh routine thing. Um, That's it. So assuming literally all of that is off the table this year, uh, you're not, putting a set together for Shambhala, I assume this year, like you would, uh, be, you would be thinking about that sort of now, right? If Shambhala yeah. is happening. Um, I actually am going to put one out. So um, the very first live stream I did was on 420 on April 20th. And that was with Westwood and uh, Shambhala. And we uh, did a big, did a big live stream party and I made a big complicated set, kind of like a weed smokers party, best of sticky buds kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I'm going to release that on uh i i think it's in three weeks but i'm gonna release it on 420 days to shambhala okay 21 um so i'll put that out then uh whenever that i think it's like may 28th or 29th or something like that uh but yeah i mean like what you said was true yeah i just had like a nice circuit going all around the world i started scaling it back a little bit just because i did that for literally 10 years of like one one to four continental tours every year. Uh, when I got a, my solid love of my life girlfriend, Marie, and we moved in together, you know, kind of touring changed a little bit. I didn't quite want to be gone for two months at a time all over Eastern Europe and stuff. And I still do my Australian tour every year. Uh, I, I, I'm really grateful I got to do that this year before I literally got home and then everything shut down. Um, but yeah, it's, it's nice. And, and now it's just like my focus is doing the different strains variety show and I get to put all my energy into that now. And yeah, it's great. I'm, I'm really stoked. I'm like more inspired now, I think, than I have been in a long time. Right. So why, why all the weed branding? Like you have the different strains show, you did the 420 show, you're going to put your set out 420 days till Shambhala, like you, your name is Sticky Buds, but you're not really that much of a weed smoker, right? Yeah, not anymore. But I mean, I definitely was when I became Sticky Buds. So right. I mean, my my homies and I were the stoners in high school. We were the ones smoking ounces every week, and on four twenty, we were rolling up the the two ounce joints to smoke. <laughs> and uh, I had my time in the industry as well. You know, like uh, we used to go work in the trim houses in Canada. And I mean, before before everything kind of started getting legalized in America, which was so amazing that the state started doing it before Canada did. But like all the weed from BC where I grew up used to go, you know, to America that, and a lot of, uh, young kids had their start earning, uh, you know, doing some work for them. And that was a part of my, my life for, you know, the early part of parts of my life. I'm, uh, completely legitimate now and, uh, you know, always have been, but, um, <laughs> Yeah. So I was a very adamant smoker. And then, yeah, I, I was also a very adamant cigarette smoker. Uh, not at the start, but I think when I was 20, oh, I guess. Yeah. Out of high school, when I started working in kitchens, you know, some of my first jobs, I started smoking cigarettes. 
And then I just found that smoking cigarettes and smoking weed made me feel like shit. Um, and then I was addicted to cigarettes. I wasn't addicted to weed. So we kind of just lost out. Um, I quit smoking cigarettes. Thankfully, after 15 years, I just had my one year anniversary a couple months ago. Nice. And, um, did you quit using Chantix or nicotine no, gum or anything like that or, or cold jewel turkey. Or, I just cold, cold turkey, turkey baby. No, nice. no vaping, no nothing. I mean, that was the only way that I was going to quit. And I mean, it took me, took me four or five serious two month tries and then I'd go back out on tour when I'm at home it, it was easier because I could get in a good workout routine and just be like in my zone but then I go back out into like DJ nightlife and be waiting to play a set or just like you know on tour or whatever or like get drunk after my set and just have that one cigarette and it's that one cigarette you can't have you can't have one literally that's the uh, thing it takes you like a few tries I think to realize that you can't just have one like I mean and that's the thing is like some people can which is like it gets confusing because you see other people like because I've, I've quit cigarettes like uh, four or five times now as well and I've like gotten to that point as well where I'm sort of like all right some of my friends can do that like they can have that one cigarette and they they won't go buy cigarettes again but like i'm just not of that mindset or personality with almost any drug actually like i can't just have like one beer either you know like i'm one of those like as soon as i have one beer i want to have like fucking 50 beers like i i just am yeah. i'm not of, of that personality trait where i <laughs> like uh people call it like an addictive personality or whatever I, I guess like I'm more in that boat and same with cigarettes. Like it's, it's, if I ever have just one or whatever, I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm fucking, I'm a smoker again. I'm the same way, man. Uh, there's been a lot of things in my life that I've just straight avoided because I never wanted to even know if I liked it or not. Um, but yeah, cigarettes was definitely something I was super addicted to. And it's a really great feeling when you, when you conquer a battle like that, but yeah, it takes time. It, it, you definitely have to like learn how your own brain works and like overcome those obstacles but yeah man i'm stoked and i mean point being since i've quit smoking again i've started to enjoy smoking pot again dude and me then, too and, yeah yeah and um i've been taking cbd actually for years now that was kind of like I, I didn't smoke weed and i didn't really like thc but i loved the cbd just like super relaxed me at night i'd sleep really well so i mean i've been taking cbd tincture for probably like I don't even know, six or seven years now, probably. Uh, but now that I stopped smoking, I, I, I still don't smoke a ton, but like, I don't know, a couple of times a week, I'll smoke a joint and just chill with Marie and turn the brain off and just like relax. It's nice. Nice. Um, what are you working on musically? Are you doing like any are you working on like an album or are you just sort of like concentrating on sets for the, for the different strange show or what's, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah. Uh, I'm feeling like super inspired right now. So I have two collabs. Uh, Nick from the funk hunters and I are doing a tune and, uh, K-Lab and I are doing a new tune, but also I just, uh, signed up to go back to school and fix all the bad habits I have. So I signed up to, uh, Ill Gates producer Dojo couple of weeks ago which uh i've just been loving it man like he's so smart and i really like his teaching style and i definitely have things in my repertoire that i need to fix procrastination and just like not enjoying writing music sometimes like it's felt like work for a lot of time and i think that's just because of the way that i've always written tracks which is trying to do everything at once and always being like okay, I need to write my super good track now that everyone's going to like and like maybe I'll get more gigs for. I'm trying to curb that and just like go back to a lot more experimentation and just writing music to write music and just having fun. Uh, so yeah, so I've been kind of like going through those motions and then yeah, getting really stoked on doing the uh, the different strange show. This is going to be week two, but I guess it'll be my third live stream. But it's really fun just like going through my promos and all my talented friends are sending me all this amazing music. And then I get to make like radio stingers and like, just kind of like take the piss a little bit on kind of like the format and put my own spin on it. And yeah, I'm just really stoked on music in, in general. Uh, uh, yeah. That's one, one thing I think I'm like grateful for in my career or just in the way that I've sort of operated in terms of a producer is at every turn when somebody has been like, oh, we have to do it this way because more people will buy it or we have to do it this way because you'll get the show or like you will ha like music has to be done in like whatever way. I'm, I'm grateful that I've sort of stuck to my guns with being like, no, fuck that music should be fun like all the time. And because of that, I've just never 
ever experienced um, this feeling of like music being work or this fe- or this feeling of like I can't write music because I'm uninspired or anything like that. Because I always I like I see music writing to me is like this really cathartic thing. Like I do it because I want to chill, like and relax. Yeah, that's great, man. I wish I wish I felt like that. See, for me, it was always like getting home from one of these tours and having like a month of time blocked off before the next one started to be like, okay, write your next single now. Like it was just like, it was always very goal focused and it's, yeah. And I mean, I still want to put out EPs and stuff and like, I'm really proud of the the album and the remix album that came out that I put out two years ago, um, take a stand. But I think, yeah, I just want to make songs. I just want to do all sorts of stuff. I, I think that album, I'm glad I put out one and I'm sure I'll make an album again, you know, down the road, but I'm definitely just going to make singles and uh, just like have a lot more fun, fun with it and have a lot of fun with the radio show. Yeah. Uh, if I could suggest anything <clears throat> to anyone listening, it's that like, e- even if you are goal focused as a music producer and you're like, oh, I have to make uh, songs for shows and I have to you know, make an EP to put out on this label by this date so I can tour around it, which I also do. I would say you should also balance that out with at least one day a week, just getting in the studio with no goals, like just getting in the studio, not to be like, I I need to learn this new plugin or I need to make this YouTube video or I need to make this, finish this song or whatever. Like I I would say like one day a week, you should just open Ableton with no goals and just click around and just fuck with it. Cause like, that's in my opinion, the most fun thing. Cause a lot of people espouse this same idea of like, oh, music writing used to be fun, but now it's not fun. And if you kind of question them on it, you realize that the reason why is because when they first started, they were treating it as like this more exploratory thing. And now they're treating it more as like a goal based work thing. Right. And I feel like if you just at least give yourself one day a week um to be back in that exploratory mindset that can like do a lot of good you know it kind of feels like you're a child again just sort of figuring out all this shit without having too many rules attached to it or too many like i need to get xyz finished sort of parameters surrounding what you're doing yeah i'm trying to get back to that i I know i will so um, i'm looking forward to it kind of just doing some spring cleaning i've been going through my sample bank like my my sample library was like 400 gigs of just like so many things i never use like so i've just been making best of folders and just deleting so much stuff like i deleted 200 gigs of stuff i've never used last night i i did the exact same thing the other day i built a new computer and i was like i'm not putting my sample library on this computer in the state it's in so what i did was i put it all on an external hard drive and then moved it over to the new computer and sort of dragged in like folder and sample by by folder and sample by sample like um and named everything nicely and set everything up all nice and it feels fucking so much better right to like go into your environment and be like shit everything is like nice and clean yeah and being organized i mean like when i did um so i hired four different voice actors for the the show that i'm doing to like make the intros and and stingers and song transitions so i had like these four huge vocal sessions and i have like you know all the voice actors and like reggae people and jingles and like I've worked with so many people giving me shout outs and stuff I was just like I kind of have them all in a main Ableton session and I'll go in and I'll pick the pieces out that I need and it's really cumbersome and it takes forever so I just spent like an entire day and I edited like 600 vocal dialogue bits and I exported every little piece every little saying like uh compressed it and EQ'd everything like really nice and then just like exported every little thing into like each voice actor or artist um, own folder and like titled each wave file what they're saying and then when I started building the actual stingers for the show I was just like so fast at grabbing everything because I could like search for exactly what I know that I wanted and everything was just so organized so I'm just like on a huge mission right now just to like do that with my entire sample library know what I have get rid of all the inefficiencies just get the best stuff and then I think I can you know because even just like looking for a crash symbol for example I like hey command F crash in Ableton and I have 75,000 of them and there's so many and it's always the same ones that come up at the top and then it's mixed with like stems from my like multi-track recording libraries and it's just like an absolute mess so I'm just dude I, I had the same issue where like I would type control F crash right but then it wouldn't even bring up a bunch of good ones like for instance um I have a sample pack by Emperor who's an amazing producer yeah and, totally. and all of his uh, samples are called like evac one evac two evac three like and it's all just from 
this big pack but like when it says like evac one or whatever that is in a subfolder in his pack called like kicks or something so it's like you can get to the shit you need it's just you have to do it through the folders you can't do it by searching for the samples but the other thing i noticed is after i cleaned up all my stuff i made a drum and bass tune that sounded like legitimately awesome using like emperor samples and and you know samples by tech vision and just like really good producers who make really sick sounds for those styles i was able to throw together a drum and bass tune in like 30 minutes nice and then i was kind of like oh man i don't like i don't feel like i've worked hard enough for it it's like <laughs> you apply value to, to effort invested right like if you invest a shitload of effort into something you're, you're you're instantly more susceptible to thinking that that's more valuable and that that's like a better thing that you've done um and I find like making music is almost too easy now that I can just grab samples and all that shit. So now I've gone, what that makes me now want to do is just make more sounds from scratch, I guess. Cause right. I'm like, I can see everything there. I can easily just grab it, but then it makes my brain sort of go, well, like, oh, maybe we should make more sounds. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, whatever makes you happy or, or stoked at the end of the day is the right way to go about it. Yeah, I would agree. Fuck yeah, man. Well, um, yeah, we, should, we could probably wrap up there if, if you're comfortable with that. Did you want to mention anything else or talk about anything else? Oh, no, man. I'm, I'm super stoked. It's been really nice to chat with you, homie, and I'm really happy about everything we covered, you know, two, two things that I think are important, economics and having fun with music. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, fuck yeah, man. Uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, homie. I'm proud. I'm proud of you. I'm proud to see you doing this, and uh, I've listened to a bunch of the podcasts. I've always really, really enjoyed them, and I'm stoked to always see you growing and, and kicking ass. We've been friends for a long time. Yeah, man, like 10, 10 years now, or something nice. close, well, close to. Keep being awesome, homie. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, cheers, man. Have a good one. You too. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast.